Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, a window into the soul of the North Fork of Long Island. We'll delve into the pulse of our community, its pressing issues, promising opportunities, and the rich stories that weave our shared history. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode 72, we sit down with Louise Harrison, a Long Island naturalist. We explore her childhood in Queens, where she frequently took trips upstate, sparking her love for nature, plants, and animals. Louise shares her journey through college and the many roles she has taken on throughout her life, starting with her work as a regional parks naturalist for the New York State Parks Department in the Long Island region. We discuss her success in preserving the Central Pine Barrens in Suffolk County and her dedication to keeping the Long Island Sound healthy. Louise also delves into her current endeavors with Plum Island and her involvement in its preservation. In addition, we talk about her hopes for the future of the North Fork's environment and the challenges we face in changing our mindset towards living in harmony with nature. So I hope you enjoy episode 72 with Luis Harrison. This episode was recorded June 18th, 2024. Thank you so much for coming on to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast today. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Thank you, Chris. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. So to start off, can you state your name and give us a brief introduction about yourself, where you were born and raised? Sure, sure. I'm Louise Harrison. I'm the Long Island Natural Areas Manager at Save the Sound. And I um, currently live in Peconic here on the North Fork. I love living on the North Fork. And I've been here about 14 years, but um, have a fairly long relationship with it. Um, I I was born um, in, uh, in Manhattan, but uh, grew up in Queens in Forest Hills and uh, where my mother was born. And I was raised sort of in two places uh, in Forest Hills where I went to public school. And then I spent my weekends and summers in uh, Putnam County uh, near the town of Kent where my grandparents had a place that my father and I would, and sometimes my sister would go to. Uh, So my parents split up when I was somewhere between five and six. So I, you know, I had that custody thing going on Mm -hmm. and went back and forth. Um, But I I couldn't wait for Friday afternoon so that I could go up to uh, the Carmel area and uh, felt like that's where I That's where I was. I felt like Mm. I was waiting to get to where I live. (laughs) And, um, but I was, I'm very grateful for the public school um, education I had. I was really, really lucky to have uh, an excellent public school education and I'm grateful for it. I, every day, grateful uh, for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, but my city kid friends uh, didn't always understand my interest in nature. And um, I would try to uh, introduce them, and um, but I was a shy person, and uh, I, I didn't take teasing and bullying very well. I didn't know how to work with that, so mm-hmm. I, I was a little bit quiet as uh, growing up. Um, mm-hmm. And I always had friends, but I would have one-on-one friendships, and mm-hmm. they were always people who loved animals like I did and loved nature like I did. So, uh, you know, I certainly had my place, but, um, but I couldn't wait for the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. And what did your parents do for a living? My dad was a general surgeon, and he practiced in Manhattan. Um, so I was the kind of kid who knew what it meant to be on call, and mm-hmm. uh, so it wasn't an easy schedule for him. Um, sometimes we'd even have to leave our, our cabin, uh, in Putnam County, um, Mm. for, to get back to, back to the city for him. Uh, but he was a naturalist at heart. And I think when he was growing up, if there had been a, 
opportunity to be an environmental scientist of some type or a conservation biologist like I am, he probably would have jumped at it. But he had he had a very strong interest in science and technology, and he was inventive. He ended up inventing a very important instrument during his lifetime. And my mother was um, a, a fine artist, and um, she wasn't making a living doing it, but she uh, was very good at it, and she enjoyed uh, teaching young people about art as well. Mm. And could you say what your father invented? He was involved um, on a team of people from Columbia uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons under the uh, under the direction of... Um, Oh, now I'm going to forget his name. That's crazy that I forgot his name. <laughs> it may come to me later. But in any case, um, they were involved in creating uh, an instrument that's used to detect heart murmurs mm. and to uh, interpret them using sound, sound waves and um, instruments to, uh, to p- graphically represent what was going on with the heart. Mm. Well, that's that's really fascinating. Now, for you, you mentioned having that city life and then more nature. Yeah, a city, city country girl, yeah. <laughs> but what activities would you do, say, in the city as a child? Because you were in Queens, but would you go into the Manhattan at all? Or oh, When I was older and I could... I could ride the subways by myself you know as teenagers we always went into Manhattan that was the thing to do but when I was younger and I was in my own neighborhood um, of course I played with the other kids and we did the New York City type games like Ring Alivio and Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) things like that Um, but you know when I was with uh, uh, you know walking around with my friends I was trying to introduce them to nature we would I would point out flowers and shrubs and try to give them vocabulary to go with them. And and uh, I guess I was unusual in that way in the neighborhood, but that's all I cared about, it seemed, was animals and plants. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, I was big into dogs and horses, but horses weren't as available as I wanted them to be, although you could go to Forest Park and ride. And uh, so when I started earning money, I would spend my dollars doing that Mm -hmm. um, and occasionally had a dog. Uh, So, you know, those were my interests growing up. And then in the country, um, my my dad basically didn't want me indoors at all unless it was thunderously raining uh, in torrents. So I would occupy myself uh, studying things and looking at things and um, catching frogs. And um, we had a giant jar. I was fascinated alone by how big this jar was, but I could put things in that. I would make a terrarium and then capture animals and put them in. And my father said I could look at them for like an hour and then I had to let them go. That was the practice. So I, I remember sitting at the picnic table, staring into this you know terrarium type thing that I had mm-hmm. made and with different toads and frogs and um, different kinds of insects that I would find and um, and stare at them. And that's when I discovered that toads and frogs have absolutely beautiful eyes. They, the, the, uh, the iris of their eyes looks like crinkled foil. And um, oh. I remember loving that. Um, but I always had to let them go. So that was uh, a teaching lesson, too. Mm -hmm. My father taught me to respect nature. Yes. And in terms of your schooling experience, how was that? And were you always interested in science throughout your whole... um, I didn't know what science was. I... I it sounded hard, but I didn't know what science was. I remember uh, 
probably one of the earliest science lessons I had in grade school was about how electricity works in a very simple way. And, you know, that was technical, but I didn't understand what's, what science could be until uh, earth science in ninth grade. And I just ate it up. It was answering so many childhood questions. Uh, I just always had so much wonder about the world. And now there were words and systems and processes that people had looked at and figured out and could explain and uh, <clears throat> and more questions. It That just grabbed me. And then, of course, biology was my big love. And uh, that was the next year, um, enhanced by probably a crush I had on my biology teacher at the <laughs> time. But I was, I think I was born to, I think all children are born to be naturalists, fr quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we get it taken out of us. Um, I kept with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, biology became the thing I truly loved. And ecology in particular, because it talks about how plants and animals interact with the environment. Mm -hmm and how systems are sustained. So I think I've always been sort of a systems kind of a thinker. Yes. And that's uh, that's always fascinated me. But a real uh, empathy for, for animals. And uh, that started very early in my life. And then I started understanding how important their habitat was to them. Mm -hmm. And now, coming out of high school, did you know what you wanted to do as a career? I knew that before I had words for it. I knew that in grades. I knew that before grade school. Mm -hmm. I knew that at some point, probably when I was about maybe five, that I wanted to protect animals and I wanted to protect them from losing their homes. I didn't have the word habitat yet in my vocabulary. But there was a particular moment that seared into my brain, and I'll never forget it, where my dad and I were uh, waiting in a horrible traffic jam to get upstate to, well, I know Putnam County doesn't seem like it's upstate, but it is north of Westchester, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to get up there uh, when they were building the interstate highway system. And it was... Uh, horrible congestion so we sat in the broiling sun in his big old oldsmobile watching them take a mountain down oh it seemed like a mountain to me um a huge machinery and noise and dust hot sun and i was watching them push trees over as they were at the top of this hill of rock i knew that animals lived in trees and so I asked my father what's going to happen to the animals and where they were going to live. Mm -hmm. And he, was a, he loved me very much, but he, he also, I think, knew who I was and uh, how I needed to know answers to things. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a practical realist. Had to be with his profession. Mm -hmm. um, he said to me, um, they're going to die. They have, there, there's no place for them to go. He didn't hide that. He did not you. hide or sugarcoat it. And mm -hmm. uh, I was very upset and I knew that I had to do something. And that always just stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So over the years as I was learning that there actually were topics in school that fit me like a glove, and that I could pursue. Um, I knew there was, you know, I came to know the word conservation and I came to understand biology and I wanted to be a conservation biologist. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do because I thought if I could somehow conserve natural areas, help the situation, mm -hmm. that I could keep animals in their homes and that was just in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so for your 
bachelor's did you, did you go for a, a bachelor's in biology bachelor's yeah in biology. yeah my master's work was in ecology at rutgers mm. and was that a good experience through um college college was a different experience altogether because i was at a school with people who grew up mostly i think in suburbia and i was by then there was a strong part of me that was a city girl, a New York City girl, who had grown up during the civil rights era and had a notion about things that I found was not always the same as other people. So I ended up in, at St. Lawrence where I found out some people came from very conservative backgrounds and uh, often had prejudices and vocalized things that I had never heard people vocalize that were offensive to me. That was an awakening at my college. I don't mean to put down St. Lawrence University. It's a fine school. It's a fiery fine school. And I wouldn't have had my career in in conservation launched if I the same way if I hadn't gone there. Mm -hmm. But socially, it was an awakening to me to be with people that were quite different mm -hmm. from from me. And um, I guess that's part of what it is to go to college, is to have new experiences. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that stuck with me. And I think uh, I was paying my own way through school, and it was a very expensive school. And um, it took me a while, and about with pneumonia, where I lost some semester, uh, a semester, that um, to realize I needed to buckle down. And so I... I finally, my junior and senior years, I really pushed hard. Mm. Um, and I wanted to graduate with my class and make up the time, and I did, and uh, became more and more serious about about what I, why I was there, mm -hmm. why I was in college. I, I wasn't floating through. I, I wanted to be very serious at that point. Mm -hmm. And upon... Um graduating were you wanting to focus on Long Island and the environment no, no. you were pretty open I, I wanted to uh, when I graduated my my dad died and uh, within a month or so and I ended up being handling his affairs at the same time applying for graduate schools so it was a rough quarter um, I had a rough time in graduate school too, with a major car accident and uh, not not having enough uh, money really to do what I needed to do. It was just a tough time, mm. and uh, so. But again, excellent education in the ecology program at Rutgers, and um, soon was working as a as an editor for Academic Press in their biology their biology treatise production section for a year. I came to Long Island because as much as I was learning doing editing, um, it was a desk job, it was indoors, it was on Fifth Avenue, it wasn't what I'd gone to school for. It, you know, I ha it helped that I'd had a biology background, but because uh, I understood what I, in large part, but not entirely what I was editing. Mm -hmm. It was very technical. On, about cancer and chemotherapy and things that I'm not an expert in at all, but I wanted to not do that forever. And a, a job came up with New York State as a naturalist uh, for the park system. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I came to Long Island. I started off with New York State Parks as their regional park naturalist. Mm -hmm. And I, I started looking at all the parks that we had that were state parks on Long Island. And I realized our ecosystems here were very similar, but not exactly, but very similar to what I had been learning about in New Jersey. There was a Pine mm -hmm. Barrens area, just like in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There were coastal ecosystems that I had been studying, like I did in New Jersey at Rutgers. And that mix of, uh, that sort of interface between suburbia and natural areas that you had in New Jersey uh, traffic like we had in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some similarities. And um, that's where I, I came to live in the Setauket area. And I stayed there for about about 36 years. But mm -hmm. I wasn't 
I wasn't with state parks the whole time. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had a lot of different positions in the years that I've worked on Long Island. But it's all been more or less for conservation and overall the environment and yeah, trying to preserve. Yeah, yeah, there was one year where I actually went, uh, commuted from Setauket back to New York City. And I was the assistant director of the Council on the Environment of New York City. And they now call it Grow NYC. Um, but that was interesting. And I had to stretch a lot for that. I, I, there were four programs that I helped to oversee. But what was hard was all of a sudden I was required to do a lot of things I'd never done before. One of them was to host a television show on cable television. And that was terrifying. But also, once you've done it, you say to yourself, oh, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it was a stretching and learning. You know, there was there were publications I had to put together. I had to work with other not for profits and build projects. I was there a year, but it was memorable. And, and I felt pretty accomplished. And I met a lot of other in New York City environmentalists. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when did, I, I had a question about Stony Brook's last forest. Oh, well. And I was curious about <laughs> that and yeah. how that came about. And Yeah, I, you know, but in between. Yeah, I didn't um, know if it was skipping. There was a lot of stuff that happened before that, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but I did end up working for three, including parks, three different state agencies, and one of them was the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, mm -hmm. where I was doing wetlands conservation and permitting work. Um, another was New York State Department of State, where I was uh, based on the Stony Brook campus, but working for and with people in Albany in the coastal program who are involved with the policies that help us manage uh, our coast. And I identified along the north shore of Long Island um, 13 areas that qualified for a, a program we were setting up called Regionally Important Natural Areas, where there were there's a preponderance of of natural and possibly even historical elements that required management and were at risk and so we identified and mapped these and wrote about them and um, offered communities means to give those areas special protection you know if they mm -hmm. would take the bite uh, that's also when i learned how certain towns on long island wanted nothing to do with any suggestions coming from New York State. <laughs> so that I, I started understanding some local <laughs> politics at that point, which I hadn't understood very well. Mm -hmm. I also worked for Suffolk County Office of Ecology when it was formed, and I headed the Bureau of Environmental Management. Um, Bob DeLuca was in that bureau, as a matter of fact, um, mm -hmm. from the group for the East End. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I were there for the whole six years together. Uh, we had a crew of seven or, or nine people in my bureau and that was very interesting work and that was around the time of the the launching of the the lawsuit that eventually by the Long Island Pine Barren Society that that eventually brought about the laws to create uh, the Central Pine Barrens protection area so that was an exciting time to be there um, we also took parcels that uh, the, the county would acquire through tax default or other means and um, put them in the county's nature preserve category. Mm -hmm. And that would be, that was useful and helpful work. Um, so I started learning a lot more about how government works when I was in more local than, than mm -hmm. state. And so there was a time period after I worked at Department of State where I was freelancing. And I worked on grants from the Environmental Protection Agency for uh, that were um, uh, awarded by various nonprofits. Um, I worked at, at, for the Nature Conservancy on, on one of their grants at one point, and I did 
a lot of interesting work as a freelancer. And that's when the Stony Brook's Last Forest thing came up. There was a, a tract of land in Old Stony Brook that was destined for over 40 houses, and the community was very concerned. And they were so accustomed to not being able to fight the person who was proposing this that they actually thought about fighting it from the middle instead of from a solid stance of conservation. And what Mm. I mean by that is they were ready to walk in and design the housing development so that it would be aesthetically pleasing instead Mm. of saying, hell no, this is a forest that we (laughs) want to protect. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke up and I said, hell no, Um, Mm -hmm. look at the slopes. This, this is a disaster. This can't be. And as I, as I went through the forest, I realized and looked at ancient maps of the area, I realized there was a portion of that forest that had never been cut over. And so there were incredibly old trees in there and there was a a forest type that needed protection. Mm -hmm. Um, It also was next to a community resource that was beloved, which was a horse farm. And I knew that farming and suburban development side by side cause conflicts. Mm -hmm. People don't like flies, they don't like piles of manure, they don't like dust that horses kick up. Mm. And there, that it was ripe for long-term conflict, and and eventually the horse farm would lose that battle. I mm. just saw that coming, so we rallied the community, and we actually by reaching out, it, within two weeks, we had two thousand people signing up. We created a mailing list, and uh, we fought that. We fought it, and we got the county to buy the land, and no sooner had they. Uh, had, had they bought it from this uh, proponent of the development when that uh, same person made a deal with the United States Post Office to expand the post office in Old Stony Brook. And that meant they were going to cut away the remaining forest that was not held by the county now, mm. right up to the edge, and create a canyon. And that enraged us. So that got us into legally a legal uh, area, trying Mm -hmm. to fight that through the courts. Mm -hmm. So we had managed to save 37 of the 43 acres and get it acquired by the county, and it was a preserve. But right then, they were cutting away right to the edge of the nature preserve. And uh, we were in the courts with that. And the whole process went from, went for 13 years. Um, The first... three years where we were trying to protect the nature preserve and gearing up for a lawsuit on the post office I put incredibly long hours in every day and I um, I wasn't making enough income really Um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't making anything off of that um, except you know people would try to help me out here and there uh, and say well you should charge for this you should charge for that but it wasn't like a job it mm-hmm. was basically volunteering. and But it was incredibly important learning experience to learn about leading a coalition mm-hmm. and how to delegate, how to trust, how to find the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the every all the diversity of people that you want to have in a coalition, mm-hmm. each with separate talents and tasks. It was an amazingly wonderful experience. And it seemed to me, and I think people were telling me that it was that experience in that community that drew professors from the university to become involved in local affairs for the first time. And after that, the, the six, we actually had quite a bit of success with the coalition. The post office got built but we actually did win the lawsuit on appeal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the the post office was being built as we were winning. And that can happen sometimes with environmental battles. 
if you don't have enough money to get an injunction or to get post a bond, mm. um, you can be prevailing in the courts and losing on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But it was it was that kind of an experience that brought out these Stony Brook professors, and they then, after we were through with that, they started their own groups and other community groups sprung up. And now there's a group there that's been there ever since called the Three Village Community Trust, which has really pulled the community together to preserve historic properties, uh, do other kinds of preservation of land in the neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a strong community presence now. So we it was sort of like a seminal battle that got everybody galvanized. It, it really was a coalition. It had 63 businesses in it, as well as our mailing list was 750. And it was really rocking and rolling for a long time. And I, I you mm -hmm. know, as a person, I tremendously, de I de de developed tremendously after that. I learned an awful lot about how to, how to live in the world and how to find people with similar goals and work together. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working with coalitions now in my present work and um, there are many lessons learned from that one that mm -hmm. have put me where I am today. And what was the time frame for that well, project? Well, around that... 1999 till 2012, I guess, wow. somewhere in there. And by then I had found you know, full-time work again. So the, mm -hmm. there, I already, by then I had been the executive director of Friends of the Bay in Oyster Bay. Mm -hmm. And after that, I uh, worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and um, on the Long Island Sound Study. And I was commuting from Setauket to Stamford, Connecticut and back every day for mm -hmm. four years. I rode the ferry <laughs> and a train. I took a train and... Um, did the reverse every day except Fridays and so four days a week I had a five-hour round-trip commute to work mm -hmm. it's a long long commute yes <laughs> uh, again learned a lot and um, uh, when that was over I moved to Peconic mm. but also from when you got started working more in the state you said the Pine Barrens out mm. here, and mm. that wasn't initially um, preserved? No. The Pine Barrens is now the third New York State preserve after the Adirondacks and the Catskills, forest preserve. Mm -hmm. But that was a long battle. And that started in about 1989 or mm. so in terms of the lawsuit that brought that, those Long Island Pine Barren Society uh, brought that lawsuit. They sued the towns of Brookhaven, Southampton, and Riverhead, and the county of Suffolk, and the, on something like, I, don't, I may have the number wrong, but I think it was something like 234 subdivisions that were planned for the Pine Barrens that would have basically wiped it out. Wow. And... Um, I, at the time, uh, was working at Suffolk County Office of Ecology, and Bob DeLuca would come and he'd say, Louise, look at this. We've got yet another subdivision. You know, maybe we had two or three that were, and then one week there were seven more. So we had a, a sort of a, a brand new GIS system at the time, and we had a guy who was working on it. I said, you know, let's get this on the map and let's take a look at this and see maybe we can suggest to Brookhaven how to uh, find wildlife corridors in between these subdivisions because this is really something. But I'd no sooner said it when, you know, 10 more subdivisions were being uh, proposed. It became like the wild, wild west of subdivision proposals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in hindsight, we've learned that developers were working off of each other's purpose uh, purchases to raise values and get high comps and mm -hmm. um, we were in a position to comment on all these subdivisions under the state environmental quality review act and i wrote a letter to brookhaven and said you know 
now we're up to 127 or something. Um, this is scary. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you're putting people in harm's way. The pine barrens burn, and um, it's like it, putting backyard barbecues and the pine barrens together. You're asking for wildfires. What are we doing here? Let's protect. And all this was just building and building. Um, at the same time, the Long Island Pine Barrens Society understood that we were mapping these. Mm -hmm. and came and, and so did the Nature Conservancy uh, at the time. And the, and people said, you know, let's use this map and um, as part of our campaign. But by the time they brought their lawsuit, I think that was 234 subdivisions were planned, massive subdivisions. Wow. Um, there wouldn't have been a much left. So we were there. Um, you know, we didn't bring the lawsuit, but I found ways to volunteer after hours mm -hmm. for the Pine Barren Society. And I would go on Tuesday nights and on the weekends and help because I believed in the cause of, of protecting these. But I had to, and I did, toe the line. And I, um, I understood that I, I had obligations as a public servant and I couldn't work against my employer so, and I was not planning on working against my employer, so I did not. Um, mm -hmm. But I was able to guide the Pine Barren Society onto what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And I could tell them what questions to ask, and then as a public servant, I could provide the answers during office hours mm -hmm. as, re as I could legally do under the Freedom of Information Law. Mm -hmm. And w was there also talk at that time in terms of wa water and with in terms of its connection with the Pine Barrens? Well, there that's a good question because the Long Island Pine Barrens Society existed for a long time prior to this as a group of naturalists who put out publications about nature in the Pine Barrens. Mm -hmm. And they knew that the Pine Barrens was the home of endangered species and they they felt that that was important and wanted to protect the Pine Barrens for its amazing ecosystem services and characteristics and as a home of endangered, threatened, and special concern species. But they also ne knew they needed to raise money for a lawsuit, they needed to have a lawyer, they needed a campaign. Mm -hmm. And they watched Richard Amper run a smaller campaign around Lake Panamoka, where he lived, against mm -hmm. a single subdivision. And how they watched how he did it. It was called Shadow Oaks at Panamoka. And he managed to kill that subdivision proposal and celebrate all the politicians who helped that to happen mm -hmm. with brass band and a picnic and a real, a real uh, community-spirited party. And... They saw what he did and they said, he's a communications guy. Mm -hmm. it turns out he was. He's a media and communications background. Mm -hmm. They said, that's what we need. So they, they made a deal with him to work with him for a certain period of time. They would, they would pay him a certain amount of money if he could raise this other amount of money mm -hmm. in this period of time. Well, he exceeded that immediately in a month and they said, basically, you're hired. Uh, Richard Amper, Dick Amper, as many people call him, he became the leading, the leader, the mm -hmm. leader of the of the Pine Barrens preservation movement. Um, again, more coalition building. I mm -hmm. watched that. I learned a lot from that as well. I learned a lot about media and press relations from him, and that has carried me too in a lot of my work since, in, in the years since then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were so many, I've had a wide variety of opportunities in my life that I'm so grateful for that I could all learn from mm -hmm. and incorporate into the next thing that came along. But the Pine Barrens, uh, you know, it was a long lawsuit. It was going to go to the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York, um, after the initial appeal, but they heard that that this was a legislative matter, not a court matter. So then they brought it to the New York State Legislature and successfully had the Pine Barrens pr 
preserved. So 1993, I think, was the was um, Mario Cuomo mm -hmm. declaring the Pine Barrens to be preserved under the Pine Barrens Preservation Act, and that set up this Joint Commission on Conservation and Policy for the Pine Barrens that developed the map that has the core area and then an area around that called compatible growth mm -hmm. and all the rules and regulations now that, that guide how how they protected the core area with transferred development rights and mm -hmm. then the compatible growth area around it where some limited development could take place. Mm -hmm. Big moment in Suffolk County history. Mm -hmm. And yes, oh, what you asked me a very specific question that I didn't answer, which is <laughs> when did the water thing come in? Because Dick Amper realized that endangered species were not going to impress enough of the right people to get the coalition to move forward. He mm -hmm. knew that drinking water was going to be the thing. Mm -hmm. And that so he emphasized the fact that the Pine Barrens sat above trillions of gallons of the cleanest, freshest drinking water that you could find mm -hmm. on Long Island. And that was truth. He spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. But that's where the rubber met the road. Yeah. And that also was the basis of the lawsuits and was also one of the defining purposes of protecting the Pine Barrens and guided future regulation of the compatible growth area. So mm -hmm. it's about, you're absolutely right, it's about water. Mm -hmm. But by protecting the water, guess what? You protect the forest above it, yes. and you're now protecting the endangered species. Mm -hmm. So the forest ecosystem can provide, continue to provide its services of filtering precipitation through clean sand that mm -hmm. hasn't been adulterated with septic waste mm -hmm. or any other waste and goes down into this giant reservoir of our aquifer, our sole source aquifer. Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking that question. And I just gave you a very roundabout answer. No, that was, that was great. <laughs> um, no, but I think it's interesting where you've served in various government and um, other nonprofit roles, but just navigating the intersection of the policy making as well as the grassroots mm -hmm. effort to with the community engagement. So I think just I think some things you kind of said over time you you gained that experience. I have. And I went from a very shy child into somebody who's comfortable more in, you know, in mm -hmm. a public arena. Mm -hmm. um, I went from, I was able to graduate from being totally tongue-tied in graduate school to being a naturalist in, uh, in parklands, orating, basically, you know, teaching people about the environment. And what a lucky break to talk about the thing you love the most. Mm -hmm. and introduce people to, you know, what feels like your world. That If you had to do public speaking, to me, that would have been the kindest way to segue into it, and it was. And then eventually having to do public speaking before, before community groups, before legislators, b before governors. Just last March, I had to go to Washington and testify in a natural resources subcommittee on federal lands about Plum Island. And I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had this sort of history of my own mm -hmm. um, going through these various experiences. People asked me, weren't you terrified? And my honest answer was that I was cold. <laughs> The room was freezing. <laughs> I hadn't had any breakfast. I was hungry. I'd had my one cup mm -hmm. of coffee, and I'm used to three or four. And that was uh, all I could think about. <laughs> so, no, I wasn't terrified. Uh, but if I hadn't had the background that I'd had over the mm -hmm. years where those public speaking skills were developing, yeah, I probably would have been frozen. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you'd asked me to do that when I was in graduate school, I, nothing would have come out of my mouth, probably. Yes. <laughs> um, also Long Island Sound stewardship has been a focus of your work including your role as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service liaison what are some of the key challenges 
um, that you see facing the sounds ecosystem and say what strategies have proven effective in addressing some of them? Well, that's a huge question. The Long Island Sound study making Long Island Sound a estuary of national significance. It's in the National Estuary Program, one of 28 estuaries around the nation that's so designated. Uh, started in 1985. I didn't go there until 2007. Mm -hmm. um, but I was aware that you know this work was going on. So it's been going on for many years. And the back in, in the late 80s, people were saying things like Long Island Sound is dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was having hypoxia problems where the which is low oxygen or no oxygen um, killing fish kills mm -hmm. um, it was having serious serious problems and people were turning their backs on Long Island Sound as if it was a cesspool mm -hmm. um, so the work that that was done in setting limits on nitrogen uh, inputs into Long Island Sound was aimed at reducing a constituent of our waste nitrogen that causes algae to have exponential growth then die fall to the bottom and the decomposers of the al the dead algae then suck up all the oxygen in the water column mm. and that was determined back then to be the culprit so putting limits on sewage treatment plants that were spilling nitrogen untreated sewage. I mean, it was treated for solids and uh, bacteria, but mm -hmm. it wasn't being treated for nitrogen removal. Mm -hmm. From New York City, Westchester, areas around the Sound, um, putting limits on nitrogen um, discharges was key in, mm -hmm. in changing that dynamic. It's not perfect, but it's come a long way mm -hmm. so that fish were coming back to Long Island Sound. And mm -hmm. when I came on, um, there were other challenges that now were also being addressed, continuing to address nitrogen discharges, but now also realizing how, or now and then, um, realizing the importance of protecting the habitats around the sound, the, not just the beaches, but the salt marshes, mm -hmm. uh, restoring them, taking better care of them, um, and again, working with communities to look after their local resources. So when mm -hmm. I came on, I was asked to work on stewardship initiatives like saving more open space mm -hmm. and um, overseeing habitat restoration efforts in Connecticut and New York that affected mm -hmm. Long Island Sound. So that was my work there. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the challenges today? They, they remain the same, but we also now, and we, it has been happening, is the, the temperatures are rising because of climate change. And so when you have temperature rising in a water body, you're losing oxygen again. Cold water holds oxygen better than warm water. It dissipates out mm -hmm. of warm water. So, and then you lose the species that, like lobsters, that were, are adapted to cooler or colder waters. They're moving north. They are. They have. They, they have. Hardly, <laughs> hard, I don't know if there's any lobsters left. They're, if there are, they're rare. Um, and there was, there was lobster disease that um, was looked at. People were thinking it was purely pollution, and then they realized, no, um, they can't take, couldn't take any more stress. They were already being stressed because of the warming waters. And so they, uh, they were susceptible to more uh, impacts. So if you know, th there have been a lot of things blamed on the lobster disease, um, or that the lobster disease has been blamed on. But um, m my understanding is, if if we'd had still the colder waters that we'd had, uh, they probably would have had more resilience, at least on a population scale. Now, to change a little bit, you mentioned. We can talk about Plum Island. You have been working on that for a while now, but it's been something that has been more in the spotlight more recently. But you're also um, on the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. 
But could you give a little history about your involvement in that and how that came about? When I worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, in 2010, I was given the opportunity to go to Plum Island with uh, others who were concerned that Plum Island had been placed on the auction block in 2008. And I fell in love with it immediately. It was fascinating. Uh, I'd always known it was there, um, and I had always known it was off limits to the public. And I never thought I'd have an opportunity to go, but I did. When I left Fish and Wildlife Service in 2011 and moved to Peconic, it was uh, pretty soon after that that I was aware that people were starting to form a group mm -hmm. to try to reverse that legislation and get Plum Island off the auction block. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started volunteering with that group and, and they, they would get together on a conference call once a month. And um, there were you know various environmental groups in it. The Sierra Club was in it, the Nature Conservancy was in it, Citizens Campaign for the Environment was in it, Save the Sound was in it. And um, so I was the the local South Hold resident that was in it at the mm -hmm. time. Um, then I got more involved with it because I realized my uh, background at Department of State in the Coastal Program um, had given me some knowledge of at least one angle on preventing a sale of Plum Island involving the Department of State. So I, I helped write a white paper um, to present to, back to the Secretary of State and ask for for New York's help in preventing the sale uh, using coastal management. And that got me mo even more involved with this coalition. So th by September 2016, I actually just joined Save the Sound. I was hired to work on the Plum Island project. Mm -hmm. So I'd been involved you know, for five, four or five years already. Mm -hmm. um, and was assigned to work in my home. I don't go to New Haven where the main office is, except mm -hmm. a couple times a year. And um, that's what I've been doing ever since. So uh, we coordinate the, the coalition and, and its activities. We still meet mm -hmm. once a month, but since the pandemic, we haven't had to do it conference calls anymore because now everybody's on Zoom so mm -hmm. or Teams. And so we have a chance to see each other's faces and work together that way. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been working together uh, very well. In 2020, we, were, we got that legislation reversed. Uh, no, Plum Island's no longer on the auction block. But uh, we have been working more closely with um, politicians, some mm -hmm. who got that done for us, uh, got it off the auction block. And... Um, and uh, as well as the congressman for this district who came in um, mm -hmm. a couple years ago. So we were trying to explore once Plum Island was off the auction block, how to preserve it in perpetuity, because mm -hmm. we knew that that wasn't the end of the story. It could still be transferred into the wrong hands that might not recognize its value to Mm. conservation the that the it's important ecological features its importance to history and the connection of um, the Montaukett Indian Nation to Plum mm -hmm. Island uh, it's, and and the lack of access that there's been at Plum Island now since the 1600s that we want to restore so with all that in mind we thought gee Plum Island might go to the wrong people if the if the federal government doesn't want it anymore because the lab is moving they might, I mean, what if they were to put a wind farm on Plum Island? That would destroy the bird population there, or or at least not, you know, cause enough ecological damage in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a real problem mm -hmm. to have industrial development on that island. Uh, so we started looking into ways to try to preserve it and we came up with after educating ourselves and talking to a lot of different groups that have been working on preserving federal lands for a long time like the wilderness society uh, on a national scale we 
we came to the conclusion that a national monument was a great model for how to preserve federal properties Mm -hmm. and that it can be done with the sweep of a pen by a president and it can be whatever the president wants it to be. It can be managed according to its proclamation. So if it's proclaimed, as we would hope, to be a national monument for ecological conservation, historical preservation, this is our, our sort of our motto, um, and for the um, discovery and celebration of our shared cultural heritage, then the management planning would follow those things. It'd be management planning for conservation purposes, management planning for conserving historical, uh, the history of the island, and and the other um, for allowing the Montaukett Indian Nation to get to Plum Island to practice its um, its traditional activities and uh, visit its sacred sites. Mm-hmm. But then we learned there's not the only way to make a national monument and that it can also be done by Congress. Mm. And we found that out um, and weren't really pursuing that because it takes a long time to pass a law in Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, We thought it would be a lot quicker if the president would just do it. But last March, we found out our congressman in this district had put in a law, uh, not a law, a bill to make Plum Island a national monument, and he took our motto, word for word, from our website and installed it there, and we thought, well, that's interesting. Let's let's see what this can do. But all we did at that point was meet with him and then found out that a suggestion we'd had, which was, you know, this would be really great if you had a hearing on this, because then we could find out some answers from some of these federal agencies that we've been knocking on their uh, knocking on doors of uh, with and and not really getting answers we want if if you had a hearing we could maybe get some answers cuz they'd be on record mhm they you know basically i don't know it's not sworn testimony but they'd have to be they'd have to be open to the committee's questions mm-hmm. so that happened and so now we have a kind of a a dual uh, campaign to the president and in Congress. Uh, whoever gets there first, we still think that the National Monument concept is a good one. It's so flexible. It doesn't have to be in any particular agency. Um, and it will follow its own either legislation or proclamation. And it can it can preserve the island the way we have come to learn it should be. And um, that's where we're at right now. We're trying to get more co-sponsors for the legislation, and we're still pushing with the White House to uh, to have a, it proclaimed a national monument. We have an election coming up. There's a lot at play. We don't know who the congressperson will be in this district, mm-hmm. but we do know that going back years, um, even Tim Bishop, who was a Democratic congressman, uh, wanted to preserve Plum Island, followed by Lee Zeldin, who was a uh, Republican, and now we have uh, Nick Lolota, who's a Republican, both wanting to preserve Plum Island. It's bipartisan, as environment always should be, because it is not a partisan issue, protecting mm-hmm. the environment. It's our survival, so uh, it should never be partisan. So we you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if the next congressperson will take it up or not. Although we have heard from the two Democratic candidates that they want to preserve Plum Island. So mm-hmm. on a congressional level, maybe that's safe. Uh, we don't know about the presidential level. Mm. Um, prior to his term as president, Donald Trump had wanted to develop Plum Island. President Biden hasn't spoken on it. But his agencies who work for him are very cooperative in, um, and, in, and they're recognizing the importance of Plum Island. They have come on record to talk about how important it is. So we're not there yet, but we know there's some cooperation. A lot of what happens with Plum Island right now is 
I believe, slowed down because the Department of Homeland Security still is there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, gee, you've heard me talk about a lot of experience I've had working in government. I've learned that when you work for government, you do what's in front of you right now because you're already late. And everything else is... (laughs) is backlogged. (laughs) There's always more to do than you can do. And so there's that expression of putting out brush fires. You're constantly working on the emergency of the moment. Mm -hmm. And the long-term planning is not a strength in government, unfortunately, right? It takes Mm -hmm. coalitions of people to keep pushing and saying, that's what we want, that's what we want, that's what we want. Start now. It takes time. You know it takes time. Put your heads to it. But here you have Homeland Security running a laboratory that needs 24-hour-a-day attention. They're still doing their work there. And they're cleaning up old waste sites. They're all practically done with it. Um, they've been doing that for years. Um, and prepping the the buildings uh, that they work in so that when they do leave, they'll be ready to be cleaned. Mm. And so they have a lot on their plate. And that's the president is sits over Homeland Security as well, right? Not he mm-hmm. doesn't just sit over the Department of Interior. Um, so talking about putting out brush fires, there's there's work that has to be done every single day at the Department of Homeland Security on Plum Island and. I'm guessing, I don't have hard and fast answers on this, but I'm guessing that people are saying, well, they're not leaving yet, and we're not, we'll deal with it when we have to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they want, these people want Plum Island preserved, but it's not ripe yet. I think that is where they're at. They haven't said that to us, but mm-hmm. I think that's what they're thinking based on only in my own experience realizing how slow government can be. And then they had picked um, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, Kansas State University for the site of the new dis- animal disease center. But is that still under construction? No, as far as we know, and I don't think this lab picked that place. The lab mm. was already was chosen as as a as a center um, for all kinds of of biological research. Mm. Uh, it's called the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, and the idea is to defend our agriculture and ourselves from diseases. Um, and it's going to be a biosafety level four facility, which means it will study diseases that jump from animals to people. So we know of some of those, like we had the COVID virus, and then there's Zika. We've mm-hmm. heard about that, right? And Ebola. These are these are scary diseases that really need the, you know, the most highest security, most careful attention to protocol. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's biosafety level four. Plum Island's biosafety level three. It it studies diseases that stay in the animal population. Mm. And what we've been told is that although the new facility in Manhattan, Kansas is um, built. Mm -hmm. It's now going through the certification process. Mm -hmm. It has to be first a biosafety one, then a two, then a three, then a four. When it's a four, uh, then the Plum Island operation can move there. Mm -hmm. Not because they're thinking it's gonna jump from animals to people, like foot and mouth disease, which stays within cloven hoofed animals, but because that that's the rule that they've set up, is they want the mm-hmm. whole lab to be ready for biosafety level four before anybody moves in and starts studying the pathogens. So they're continuing to do this at Plum Island every day, mm-hmm. and um, they have to because uh, pathogens mutate, and they need mm-hmm. to keep creating the vaccine to go mm-hmm. with it the mutations. Mm-hmm. We've all learned a lot going through COVID of uh, how you have to keep vaccines up to date. And um, I think everybody's a little more educated now than they were four years ago mm-hmm. about viruses and vaccines. 
Yes. So I, I, I have a lot of respect for the work that goes on at Plum Island. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it, it seems like it would, there's a lot of things in play and things might change, but mm. it might be a long way off in terms of it opening as a, mm -hmm. a place for people to visit. But I mean, you've probably gotten this question asked before, but mm -hmm. just you said that there has been cleanup and uh, mm -hmm. removal, um, but would there be like multiple in terms of checking to make sure things weren't or things weren't buried in the ground or dumped or like outside of the laboratory on the land. And there were, and that's uh, what, what's been cleaned up. So, um, you know, Plum Island has a, has a history of federal presence since the army was there. And, you know, it was purchased by uh, the federal government after 1897, just mm -hmm. around the turn of the century. Uh, our, our army, our, our, our defense system is not particularly kind to landscapes. After they left, there was already cleanup. A lot of stuff, you know, broken toilets, things like that were just littering the landscape. They had the beaches were a mess with broken items, and there were a lot, there was a lot of cleanup then. Mm -hmm. Then the lab was keeping everything on Plum Island because they were concerned. They weren't. They were studying the pathogen, and they wanted to make sure they didn't have anything leave the island mm -hmm. until they understood the pathogen better. So there were things buried. They're called waste management areas. They're pits where things were dumped. They've been cleaned up. Uh, there were areas that, that they call areas of potential concern that they had to excavate and look at and, and examine. Mm -hmm. um, what's been going on is that these identified sites have now are under the, the regulatory authority of our state, New York. Mm-hmm. Federal government leaves, that island is still in New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> New York has a vested interest in that island being clean. And uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation oversees this cleanup. Mm -hmm. And we should be grateful because New York has much higher standards for a remediation than uh, the federal government does. So it's going to be cleaner than it would be if, let's say, the EPA was overseeing the cleanup. Mm. So not to put down the EPA. It's just to say that the federal standards are somewhat looser, so um, somewhat more loose. So so we know, after speaking with the DEC recently, that um, there's just two of the sites where things were buried that um, need further action. Uh, they're going to put more sand over it and do some groundwater monitoring in the areas around. All the others have been remediated. There's there was a one one site uh, that recently there was some pesticide they they discovered got, was spilled. They they're looking at that to clean that up. Mm -hmm. um, all the other things have there there had been an oil spill there in the end of like it's like 1999. That was a lot of oil. Um, They've been remediating that ever since. That was a long process, but that's been closed. Mm -hmm. So, so we were very encouraged, I and mean, we've been meeting with DEC about this since about 2016. Um, and we hired, we at Save the Sound hired a hydrogeologist to go through all of the um, the reports that we had seen from the federal government's own consultants about the condition of the island and mm -hmm. to uh, look at the Homeland Security's progress reports and EPA's correspondence and DEC's correspondence. And, and our hydrogeologist had some questions and we went to the DEC and we started pushing on a few things and they, they ultimately agreed with us and they got the federal government to follow through. So it looks like it looks like it's going to be, I don't know if there's um, a formal pact yet or a, uh, a formal written agreement at this point, but we understand they have come to agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is very encouraging that, mm -hmm. that they're on track they, and the island will be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't think it's unsafe. I've been there twice. 
Mm -hmm. I didn't go into the inner parts of the laboratory where you need to shower afterwards to keep, you know, make sure that all the protocols are. I just was on the outdoors. I did go mm -hmm. into the administration building, and that's where they uh, give you a really interesting, um, I, I guess I'll call it a lecture, uh, a slideshow and a lecture about the work they do there. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't feel unsafe when I was on Plum Island, and I got to walk into all kinds of places. It's just a matter of making sure that the groundwater there um, hasn't, that nothing's leached out of any kinds of areas where they used to put waste mm -hmm. uh, into the groundwater there. Make sure that's in good shape because mm -hmm. um, groundwater travels and eventually it does move into Long Island Sound, right, and Gardner's Bay. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure all that's cleaned up and um, we're feeling pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to also talk about the, the North Fork when was the first time you had visited the the North Fork? Was that when you had, it wasn't when you moved to Peconic? No, no. I, you know, I've had these jobs that, um, that would had me bring... going all over the place, really, mm -hmm. you know. Um, probably the first time was when I worked for New York State Parks, which is in the early 80s. And I, I was visiting all the different parks. So I mm -hmm. went out to Orient Beach State Park. I went to uh, you know, Wading River. Mm -hmm. um, Wildwood, um, mm -hmm. met with the park managers, walked the trails, you know, learned about all the different New York State parks that we had. So that took me everywhere. And when I worked for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation doing freshwater wetlands work, mm -hmm. um, if people were wanting to know if there was a wetland on their property or if they were developing a property where there were wetlands, I went. Mm -hmm. um, so and then when I worked for New York State's coastal program, I did everything on the North Shore. I want I I I probably have walked by foot and maybe made up for with some driving, but not that much. I think I have I may have walked every bit of shoreline of the north side of Long Island wow. uh, since the early eighties, <laughs> um, wow. for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen it been it been there, in the wetland or on the beach or around mm -hmm. it, looked down at it from over a bluff, um, mm -hmm. and I've characterized a lot of these areas in order to come up with these regionally important natural areas that I developed when I was at Department of State. These mm -hmm. areas that are deserving of some additional management. Um, so, what did you? think of the North Fork initially when you first came out? Obviously, it's changed a lot. I had my first Peconic Bay scallops at uh, when, <laughs> when I came, the first time I came out to Orient Beach State Park, and the, it was winter, and the park manager at the time was very lonely because um, it, it's, it's a, it can be not, there's not a lot of visitation to that park in the depths of winter. Yes. Uh, and he, he took some Peconic Bay scallops out of his freezer and fried them up for me. <laughs> he was happy to have the company. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, what did I think? Um, you know, and has it changed? Of course, it's changed dramatically even since I've been here in 14 years. But mm -hmm. um, I used to visit, I had friends, uh, I guess it was in the 90s, I had friends in Kutchog and I, mm -hmm. I would come out maybe once a week. Um, I have seen the changes. And I I guess, you know, we benefit by having uh, fabulous restaurants. But we, in my book, we don't benefit by having more suburban development. Mm -hmm. And we don't benefit by having McMansions. Um, mm -hmm. We don't benefit by the traffic at all. And I'm keeping that in mind as we talk about future access to Plum Island. I am not interested in having that become a tourist spot. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's not good for Plum Island. We need to, we need to figure out how to manage Plum Island. We need a management plan. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that has to be based on the delicate resources that are there. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what kind of visitation Plum Island should have. And if it should be like a something like ecotourism, that that's something that... It's not good for Plum Island and it's not good for the North Fork. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I say to people, look, I live here too. Mm -hmm. Because I, like many people, I try to stay off the roads if it's not a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially yeah. in the summer season. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, you just can't live your life uh, Friday, mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday, Monday uh, out here uh, in a comfortable way with the traffic. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you you really can tell, and I'm not quote unquote from here, but you really can tell if people are from here by their behavior on the roads. Mm -hmm. That there's there's a there's an aggressiveness that um, doesn't seem to. There seems to be aggression in the way people drive. Yes. Um, it's it's upsetting. So mm -hmm. I don't want ecotourism uh, to be. There there are places where ecotourism can be done very well as mm -hmm. also, but you there's so many controls that need to be in place but to do that. Sometimes don't. Sometimes things um, slide mm. through the and they don't enforce. That's right. A lot of them. that's right because ecotourism brings in dollars. Mm -hmm. So what have, what's brought in the tourism that we have? Well, it's wine tourism, isn't it? I mean, we... They call it um, agro-entertainment. Agro, agro-entertainment, yeah. Agrotainment. Agrotainment. Yeah, agrotainment. Yeah, that would be like bouncing houses on farms and what are mm -hmm. those bouncing things? Bouncing castles or whatever they're called. Yes. Um, and, yeah. And it's, obviously... It's scary and... and to me distasteful mm -hmm. and then say from the business side of it from a from the farm or the vineyards they might say well it's we can't survive as a farm and make a living on that so we have to bring in um, wine tastings or fe festivals or like pumpkin picking and all these different things, which obviously bring out other things. And then there is the part about land preservation and, and the openness is still there, but then still, like you said, balancing that um, economic side of things and what that might bring out, which is a challenge. All of it's challenging. I think we have to decide what we want. And do we need do we do, or do we need to change our focus away, a little bit away from the tourism part or I'm no economic genius <laughs> uh, I I'm happy that people can make a living on the farms mm -hmm. um, I am concerned that as successful as Southhold has been in protecting farmland and it has been a focus and it and it should be. Um, mm -hmm. that other aspects of our natural environment are not getting the same attention with preservation and conservation. And, um, and some of these are resources that are very much in danger, like forests. We, mm -hmm. we don't have much forest cover on the North Fork at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do have in forest cover is our last best way of returning clean precipitation to our drinking water like happened in the pine barrens it's here too mm -hmm. if you have it raining on your lawn it does go down into the groundwater but if you've been adding things to your lawn it's pulling that with it so if you have a pesticide or a fertilizer on your lawn that's now leaching down into your drinking water mm -hmm. our farms are fertilized and sometimes pesticides are applied that goes down into the drinking water if it rains on our roadways <clears throat> and it runs off into a recharge basin that's been pulling the oils and greases and hydrocarbons and 
and whatever else uh, uh, comes off a car or out of its exhaust and lands on the pavement, that pulls that down mm -hmm. into the recharge basin, eventually goes into our drinking water. Sidewalks, you name it. There is no better place on the North Fork to recharge clean precipitation into our drinking water than forests. Mm -hmm. It's unadulterated. You have precip precipitation that gets naturally filtered through eons of, 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 of soil development since the last glacier that filters our water and adds it into uh, our drinking water. We need to protect more forests on the North Fork. Mm -hmm. And people see forests as a bunch of trees that are in the way of building a house. Mm -hmm. And that has to change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a lot of concerns about our, our, our environment here on the North Fork as well as around Long Island. Um, I don't have an answer. There's not one answer right now. Our globe is threatened, our planet is threatened by climate change, and mm -hmm. that has to be our top priority. We're, we might be past mitigating and moving into the area of adapting, but that doesn't mean each of us can't do what we have to do to keep it from getting worse. Mm -hmm. And um, it's serious. It's not just that the beaches are going to erode faster and some of us are going to get flooded out. Mm -hmm. It affects biodiversity, and we depend on it. We depend on all the other plants and animals in ways that we don't even know yet. And mm -hmm. there are so many species we haven't even discovered yet, and we don't know how they affect us. And we're killing species all over the world, not just with development and habitat loss, but the habitability of our planet. Mm -hmm. And the, you see the extinction of some animals that just can't survive anymore in that habitat. Right. It's become a, a, I mean, even with us, with humans, with cohabitating with other animals, that's been a challenge on the North Fork, but just as a whole for the, the world, it's um and that, and i think that's why we that's why we are seeing um a lot of varying degrees in um influxes of different species moving and loss of species as well you're absolutely right mm -hmm. it i i sometimes i wonder what you know when i i guess when i was studying uh, the early days of studying ecology the uh, the textbooks seemed very um, definite about certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what an ecosystem succeeds from this stage to this stage to this stage, and then there's a, this thing called a climax forest, and, and you read it and you thought, wow, that's fascinating, and yeah, I guess that's true. Well, now, uh, first of all, that's, that's been challenged long ago, but um, there's so many factors, and I wonder what you can teach today about what we would have expected to have happened decades ago and what's happening now with mm -hmm. ecosystems and what is a normal behavior of an ecosystem and what is a reaction to stress mm -hmm. and everything's getting stressed mm -hmm. and so it, are we living in a state of response to stress uh, while ecosystems are the, the elements of the ecosystems are trying to live their lives uh, and mm -hmm. trying to do their thing and reproduce and um, eat and live and absorb sunlight and produce seeds and all those things and how much of it is just trying to stay alive with too much heat, mm -hmm. um, too much dryness, too much, too much of so many things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And losses of others. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, it's scary. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is our advice? I think we all have to start really paying attention and learning. You can, you, people can start in their own backyards. They really can. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I believe you can start with a, a window box. You can, you, can put, 
you can help some pollinators. You can help mm -hmm. uh, some things by planting native plants. You can, you can turn off the lights when you leave the room. You can use less plastic. You can do all the things. Just do them all. <laughs> Everybody... Mm -hmm. Everybody just do it all. You know yeah. what it is. <laughs> do it all and then some more. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We, we have to live, we have to live in a more compatible way. And I, mm -hmm. the suburban model doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We've gobbled up the landscape. I flew over to, and I flew, okay, that's not a good use of energy either, but I flew to Colorado and back. I had my head at the window the entire time, and I saw the landscape of North America between um, MacArthur Airport and uh, Boulder, mm -hmm. Denver, and between and it's we've got an awful lot of suburbia where we don't have farms, and there's of course huge huge amounts of farming. Uh, ag that's big business farming. Yes. Uh, hold in enormous areas. Of, I mean, we're lucky that we have food, but it's mm -hmm. not what it was. It's not prairie anymore. It's farms. So all that mm -hmm. biodiversity is gone. And then we've gobbled up the rest of the landscape with uh, suburban developments. And I have to say, there are places on Long Island where suburban developments are so much better than you see them elsewhere. At least mm -hmm. in, we've tried to find clusters where where we've kept some open space, although mm -hmm. Long Island is a tiny little sliver when you're looking at the rest of North America. Mm -hmm. and But the d developers have had a heyday with areas where they've developed every single piece of available property with no mm -hmm. clustering and no extra patch of woods here and there, no woods left, mm -hmm. no natural areas left, one suburban development after another. It's mm -hmm. it's not even habitat for us. No, it's a, a manufactured landscape that is something that was really blossomed after World War II, but is not a sustainable option moving forward. And I think we've seen, obviously, with Long Island and Levittown and developing out this way. And I think even with the North Fork, there were plans to build up every plot um, grid like patterns, which which is fortunate. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But I see there's arguments f about, well, we are a big country and we have a lot of land, but I don't see that as a good argument. Um, and obviously with places like Houston, Las Vegas, Denver, where you have a lot of space, you can look at a map in the last 10 to 20 years and it's just so... Um, Consumptive of that space. Yes, and yeah. you can see how much that space has expanded and they've had to adapt and yeah. all these resources they have to keep expanding out and it's not a sustainable option. No. And that way of life with I think the American dream is not it has to be something where we're living I mean obviously out here I can see it more as hamlets but with city sprawl or sprawling out that has to be contained more and um, more compact environmentally friendly development and just, I think the federal and state has to get a, con a control on the land to stop more sprawl from happening. And I mean, I think in, I think I'm going, I'm talking too much here, but um, even in Canada, in Ottawa, they, I think they did try to do that in some ways where they put a green belt, mm. but now the developers have moved past the green belt and have built further out so there's this big greenway and then there's the city but it didn't really fix the problem and i don't know if you can look to some places where the cities are more compact say in smaller countries like in europe where they might have been able to preserve some of the outer 
some of the farmland or open spaces, but it's a serious problem in the U.S. I think it's also becoming a problem in Europe as well. We mm-hmm. have a lot of people on the planet, um, and we, those of us who live in capitalist societies um, have to come to terms with the fact that capitalism is based on consumption mm-hmm. and growth. And <clears throat> so without constant growth, we feel that we aren't succeeding and that we're in a recession, and mm-hmm. it frightens people. And the growth is very much built, uh, at least you know, around here and in many places on uh, construction industry. That's a large amount of growth and profit in that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and uh, my, my impression from uh, the development community that I guess you could say I've been uh, across the table from for many years is, is that they can't just make a profit. They have to make a big profit. There's no moderation in their minds. It's mm-hmm. not. Uh, there's no question they're going to make a profit because they see that as their right, and they press for the profit. But they also, um, they're not in it to lose. They're in it to win. But they have to win big. And if they're not winning big, it's killing them. Mm-hmm. And that's their impress. That's that's their communication is you're killing me. Mm-hmm. You're killing me. I need that one extra house. I need those two extra houses. You get, you're killing me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it's 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 the one industry you can get into where, I guess, nobody lets you fail. You can start any other kind of business and people let you fail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you're not supposed to lose money on real estate. It's sort of a, it's almost part of a creed. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we have to change the way we think. Mm-hmm. I was also thinking uh, about how this massive amount of, of suburban development we have in the United States has created a new normal. And this is what people think is, you know, a, a child born into a suburban development grows up into a, something like that. And that's the way it is, isn't it? That's what that's the is way it acceptable. is. Acceptable. It's not just acceptable, that's life. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that's the way it, it is. So having an emerald green carpet outside your house with carefully trimmed shrubs to look like tabletops, it's sort of like changing your plant environment around you into something that resembles an outdoor living room. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, got, you flat top the shrubs and you've got the green carpet that can't have a single aberration in its color. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody, all the shrubs stand at attention. Flowers, you stay over here. Trees are trimmed, so we have our view. And block uh, out, block out everything else you yeah. don't want to. Yeah, you block out everything else. You use fencing, and um, you've controlled. It's such a controlled uh, environment, and people spend their weekends continuing to control it. Because mm-hmm. nature wants to have its way. Weeds want to live where they want to live. And um, trees want to put branches out and f- prune themselves and drop branches and leaves. Mm-hmm. And everybody's out like trying to control it. Mm-hmm. So it's it really is a new, th- completely new way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's a hard change to bring about is to get people to... F- find the natural world as something they'd want to be compatible with and to put up with the fact the fact that you know here okay here's what happens often with native plants people have heard native plants are good and so some people have gone out and they go to sales and they bring home native plants and they Mm -hmm. put them in the ground and they're doing a good thing they are then they're concerned that the native plants are getting chewed up What's happening? Is it diseased? What kind of bugs do I have? What's the problem? It's that's what you want to have happen. You're feeding, you're feeding the local insects and birds, mm-hmm. and wildlife that depend on insects by allowing them to eat your native plants. That's part of it. It's not just pollinating them, but giving them food. Mm-hmm. And so you have to get used to a little bit of raggedy edges. It's the raggedy edges that people have a really hard time with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, it's this mindset of everything needs to be 
lush and perfect. Mm -hmm. You want every leaf to be green with entire edges and no chew marks and no black spots and that's hard it's hard for people to get used to messiness and say wow look at nature this is interesting what's eating my plant let me maybe sit here and see what's eating my plant maybe it's an attractive looking leaf hopper <laughs> maybe my kid can draw a picture of this leaf hopper <laughs> and learn what a leaf hopper is but that's that's the rare person out of the many that don't pay attention. <laughs> now, who says, who's eating it? I need a spray. <laughs> yes. Uh, or I'm going to complain to the person who sold me the native shrub because mm -hmm. it's not thriving. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's the thing. They, they do thrive. They thrive the way they're supposed to thrive. Mm -hmm. They don't lose all their leaves. They keep mm -hmm. enough of them and they come back next year. And you're helping. You're doing a service. You're giving back the ecosystem an ability to provide its services. You mm -hmm. can do it with a window box. You can do it with a garden plot. You could turn your whole backyard into something native. Mm -hmm. We stopped uh, at where I live. We stopped blowing the leaves about seven years ago in the back. And I uh, 17 eastern red cedars popped up. Seven bayberries popped up. A bunch of uh, lowbush blueberry popped up. Um, I have uh, dogwoods coming in. I have wildflowers coming in. Um, the leaves look pretty bad on the back there until about mid-May. And then all of a sudden they start disappearing on their own. They're being chewed up by the insects in the backyard and they're starting to create soil. And uh, I'm not fighting anthills, and the ants are helping uh, with seeds, and mm -hmm. um, it's starting to thrive. And I, I, I just stopped blowing the leaves. Mm -hmm. The ecosystem wanted to come back. The birds are helping, they're dropping seeds. It's fascinating to watch, but that's the kind of thing I like to watch. And it's a lot more fun than blowing leaves and pruning and sweeping. <laughs> Raking making and <laughs> making, <laughs> I can sit on my deck and watch a pageantry of nature, um, without worrying about if my green grass is the right color green. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's like you said, it's changing a habit or a mindset that has been um, enculturated, enculturated, and for well, a long time now, and. I don't I don't know. I I think we have to keep moving forward and and be hopeful about the future and the environment um but it is uh it's a challenge. It's scary. I I, I couldn't do this if I weren't an optimist, but mm -hmm. I have my moments. Mm -hmm. Um and I I mentioned Bob DeLuca earlier. Um he's got a great spirit and when we were working together daily, uh, Friday afternoon would come around and I, I would feel pretty, uh, well, just tired and, and a little bit overly challenged by the week. We were the, I, When we worked together, I would say it was the heyday of subdivisions in, uh, on Long Island. It was a huge development era. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd get discouraged by the end of the day, and, and Bob would cheerfully say, you know, Louise, I, every time I see a bird fly by, I, I think, well, maybe I had something to do with helping that burb, bird with its habitat, and, mm -hmm. you know, helps me, gives me some courage to go on. And um, I'll never forget the, that he could bring me around again. You know, I was grateful for that, because I would, I would, Maybe I had low blood sugar, but I was starting to succumb to my <laughs> <laughs> negativity. <laughs> and he, he, would, he would set me straight again. And, uh, you know, I've always been grateful for him um, for that. And it, it's hard. It's hard work. It's hard to live in your job because I see the, uh, the environment is everywhere. Their environment mm -hmm. is not just out there at the local nature preserve. The environment is in your home and out of your home. It's everywhere you go. That's mm -hmm. the environment. 
and I've, I've been trained to recognize impacts on the environment. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to train my thoughts because sometimes all I see are impacts mm -hmm. and I need to train my thoughts to, to finding, uh, to, to, to holding on to the hope and finding uh, solutions, finding small solutions that might grow. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found some of the most satisfying times have been teaching young people uh, about nature and finding out later when they come back to me. They don't all come back, but sometimes they come back and they they tell you that they either got into that career or that they remember telling their friend the same thing or they did a science project based on whatever it is that that somehow it, it made a difference mm -hmm. and that is the great thing about coming out of my own shell as i have through my life and being able to communicate mm -hmm. to people working with coalitions people who say no that development project should not stand this is there's there's nothing good that can come from it. Let's find a better way. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can preserve that land instead. Mm -hmm. And I, I I'm I'm doing continuing to do that today, not just with Plum Island but other community groups, and um, it's really satisfying. It's really satisfying to mm -hmm. to be with people who share your values and want want to help the world be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. for us all absolutely yeah i think just lastly i i asked if there was anything else you wanted to discuss or say that we haven't talked about well i wanted to thank you um you're a great conversationalist you really do listen i appreciate that thank you. um i i'm always a little uncomfortable talking about myself and I didn't have permission to talk about Bob DeLuca but I know he's well loved around in the North <laughs> Fork so hopefully <laughs> he won't mind um, I uh, I think I think I just want to tell people to uh, to get out and vote mm -hmm. that's the biggest say we have mm -hmm. and um, sometimes our elections really are by one vote we there are there are politicians on Long Island who have actually won their seats by one vote. Um, it can make a difference, and I, it should make a difference, and it means you're engaged. Yes. Um, and and that's that's our best hope. I I I, I don't know if I'm a de a democracy advocate as much as I am an ecologist, but maybe they go hand in hand. I. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I guess that's it as I I really do believe in our democracy and and I'm a, I'm an environmentalist to my core and it's how I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. It's the only way I know how right now. So um just thank you for the conversation. It's been really uh interesting to me to be able to like look back because I don't usually do that. Yes. Definitely. Um, no, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come in today and tell your story and really the the passion and love you have for the environment um, and all the wonderful work you've done and are continuing to do uh, into the future. So thanks but, for your encouragement. Thank Chris. you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 72 with Louise Harrison. I want to thank you for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you next time.